afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our webinar today on estate planning. My name is Josh Antis. I'm with California Coast Credit Union. Uh, it's great to see everyone. Hope you're doing well and are staying healthy and safe out there as we uh, see the, or head towards the light at the end of the tunnel, right? Looks like we're starting to come out of this thing finally. So I don't want to jinx it, but you know, there's some hope, right? But um, we're excited about uh, all the information we have to share with you today. But before we get started, a few things I want to share. Uh, first, I want to introduce Tim Ferrier. You might see him on screen. Maybe not. Maybe if he says something, you'll see him. But uh, <laughs> hello. There you go. Uh, Tim is with the business development uh, team here at CalCoast, and he is here if you have any questions in regards to any of our products and services, uh, becoming a member, or any of the financial education type things we have to offer, anything like that, just let us know. Uh, and Tim or I can answer your questions for you. Uh, everyone should be placed on mute for the duration of today's presentation, but we want to answer any questions you might have as we go. So uh, please feel free to enter those questions into the chat. And we have uh, three people from Trust and Will here today that are going, going to be monitoring the chat and answering their, your questions for you. Uh, we have Katie, Allison, and Fabio all standing by ready to go. Uh, so any questions at all, throw them in there and we will answer those as we go. Or if it's a question in particular for um, Patrick, who's our presenter today, uh, then we'll have him answer those at the end. And then also uh, there is going to be an evaluation survey that you will receive at the end of the presentation today. It should pop up on your screen. Uh, that helps us to gain your feedback and get better as we go. Uh, even though we've been doing the webinar version now instead of the in-person workshops for a while, uh, we still are learning as we go. So uh, please give us your feedback. We appreciate it. Uh, you'll have a chance to fill it out once we're finished, once we complete our session today, or you'll also receive that by email in the next day or so. And if you do fill it out, everyone who takes the time to give us their feedback will be entered into a drawing for a $25 gift card. I believe the gift card this time is for DoorDash. So uh, fill it out. It's real quick. It's like, I don't know, 10, 10, 15 questions, something like that. It takes no time at all. And uh, yeah, we'll pick a winner uh, and I'll, I'll uh, contact that winner in the next couple of days. All right, so uh, with that, I do want to introduce the Trust and Will team. Uh, Cal Coast has recently uh, started a new partnership with Trust and Will. Uh, they are uh, kind of, what do you, you guys call it? The um, TurboTax of estate planning, I think that's what you say usually. <laughs> yeah, that, that usually resonates, TurboTax of estate planning. <laughs> okay, but uh, they're, they're really awesome to work with and uh, they have a lot of great uh, services that you'll be able to take advantage of and also discounts available to you as well when you become a CalCoast member. So um, I'll let them talk about that a little bit more uh, later on. But I want to introduce Patrick Hicks. He is our presenter today. He's the head of legal at Trust and Will. And uh, he's got 10 years experience in the industry. And he's been uh, actually presenting for us in the past. He does a really great job. So we're excited to have him here today. And uh, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Patrick. Thanks, Josh. Let me start sharing my screen. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Um, we're going to cover some basics of estate planning. And as Josh mentioned, we're, we're really here to make sure that you get information that's, that's helpful to you. So if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you've probably dealt with this before, but there's a Q&A tab. Click it. You can pop it up. You know, ask a question. Uh, Allison and Fabio from our team are standing by to help pick these questions off as we go. And we're also going to have some time at the end to answer some um, directly. So feel free to ask questions along the way. We hope we can cover all the information you'd like, but we want to make sure that if you do have any questions that they are they are covered and, and you have all the answer, answers and information that you need. With that said, um, I hope everyone can see my screen now. Um, we have a great presentation and I, and I really love doing this and talking about estate planning. It's obviously, it's what I do, but it's one of my favorite topics. Um, we've We've been working with CalCoast for a while now, and we found that these are, are really helpful topics to, to cover. And so we're going to start with a picture of me, unfortunately. Um, that's again, my name is Patrick Hicks. I'm the head of legal at Trust and Will. And as Josh mentioned, we like to think of ourselves something like the TurboTax of estate planning. We'll talk a little bit more about Trust and Will at the end, but let's, let's start more with the focus of the agenda and estate planning today. And how do we make estate planning something that's easy for everyone? Um, the agenda today, we're going to really start with the basics of estate planning. Start with an understanding of what estate planning is and what it does. We'll cover some of the key documents in an estate plan and help you decide how to use which of those documents in your plan. And then we'll discuss who needs an estate plan and cover some of the most common reasons it might be time to create or update an estate plan. 
go over a little bit about how you might get started. And as I mentioned, we'll leave some time at the end to go over any questions. So please feel free to ask those questions as we go. So hopefully we'll cover some of them in the presentation, but any that aren't covered, we'll be sure to help answer at the very end of the presentation. So what is estate planning? That's a common question we get. Estate planning is fundamentally planning today for what happens tomorrow. At the most basic level, an estate plan lets you make decisions today for what should happen if you are unable to make decisions in the future. It's a set of instructions where you can say what you want to happen. When might that come into play? There are two primary times. One is when you die. That's what most people think of with estate planning. When you're no longer living, you're unable to make your own decisions and an estate plan can say what should happen. But the other primary time that it comes into play is during lifetime, if you experience a period of incapacity. So that's the second time where you may be unable to express your preferences and having a documented estate plan really goes a long way for you to know that your instructions are known and can be carried out even if you can't express them at that time. So why estate planning? Why should someone worry about estate planning? What is the, there we go. What are the benefits of having an estate plan? Why should people care about estate planning? And what motivates someone to create their estate plan? This is truly one of my favorite questions and there are so many reasons to care. The most common reason is simply peace of mind. Having an estate plan gives you confidence that you have taken the steps to protect yourself and your loved ones. You can rest easy knowing that you have a plan in place and you've determined what should happen if things go wrong. Having a plan also avoids leaving your loved ones with no guidance during a difficult time. And it's, it's hard to overemphasize this. Death leads to grief for your loved ones and piling on that by leaving them with no directions is, is truly traumatic for a, a lot of your loved ones after your death. And so having a plan in place goes a long way for you to help those loved ones who are still here know that the decisions they're making are the decisions that you want them to make. That peace of mind is really the primary motivating factor for most people. But a second major motivator is guardians. It's the ability to nominate guardians to care for your younger children and pets. This gives you confidence in knowing that your children will be in safe hands should the worst happen to you. And it's true that this is primarily applied to children, but it also applies to pets. Pets can be a key piece of an estate plan, and it's, it's very common for people to have a pet and want to name a guardian for that pet so that they know if something happens to them, that their pet will be cared for. A third primary motivator is planning to handle potential incapacity during lifetime. Studies show that the majority of Americans will be impacted by incapacity during their lifetime, either their own incapacity or the incapacity of a loved one. It's increasingly common with advances of medical technology, we are living longer, we are able to survive more things, but we are more likely than ever before to experience a period where we cannot express our wishes. Having a plan in place can be critical to providing the desired outcome, both for your medical care, but also your financial well-being. Having a plan in place can also make it easier for your family to respect your wishes. Some of the hardest decisions that anyone can ever have to make are deciding what should happen to a loved one. And those decisions are not going to necessarily be made easier, but what happens is you give peace of mind and you give confidence to your loved ones. If you have left instructions and they follow your instructions, they know that they did what you wanted and they don't have to second guess themselves later. So planning for incapacity is an increasingly common motivator for people to think about estate planning. One of the, the most frequently considered motivations is asset distributions and how to control where your assets will go after death. And this tends to be what people think about when they think of estate planning, but once they go through the process, it's typically not the most important motivating factor for them. But asset distributions are still important and you can choose where your assets will go after death. Common choices, you can choose to have your assets benefit your family and loved ones. You can choose to support charities or organizations and causes that were important to you during your lifetime, helping you leave your legacy even after death. And you can also choose to plan your distributions to maximize the benefit to your beneficiaries by minimizing the impact of taxes. And the last one, which is truly important for a lot of people, is business succession planning. This is often overlooked for individuals who own their own businesses, but it is critical to ensure that the business does not evaporate after death. Simple business succession planning can go a long way to ensure that your business passes on and all of the value passes on to future generations. But what is an estate plan? Ultimately, an estate plan is a set of legal documents 
containing instructions for what should happen if you cannot speak for yourself. It's typically not just a single document. It's typically a plan includes multiple documents. The documents that are in each plan may vary, and the documents in a plan should be tailored to meet your particular needs. There's no one-size-fits-all solution. Your needs may justify one set of documents, and someone else's may have a different set of documents. Each document is designed to do one thing. Your plan may just focus on one or two of those things, in which case you would only have one or two of those documents. Or your plan may be more comprehensive and have a full suite of documents. Again, it's, it's important to realize that there's not just one size of a state plan. What, what works for you should be what works for you, and it does not matter what works for someone else. And that's why it's important to have a plan that's tailored to your needs. The most typical documents that are included in an estate plan are wills, trusts, and healthcare documents. Let's dive in a little bit on each of those. Wills are the most commonly recognized estate planning document. These, most people have some familiarity with the will. They've either seen it on TV or a movie. They typically have a, an image of the lawyer opening a will and, and reading it after a death. And it's, it makes for great, great drama, but it, it's not typically how it works. Um, wills, um, to some extent, are much, much more boring than that, unfortunately, speaking from estate planning experience. But a, a will is a legal document that controls most assets when you die. And a will has three primary functions, and these handle fundamental needs that everyone should account for in planning their estate. And these primary functions are, one, distributing assets and determining who gets what. Two, taking care of kids, nominating guardians for your children. And three, specifying final arrangements and burial and funeral instructions for what should happen to your remains after death. Those are the three most fundamental purposes of a will and everyone needs to account for those in those estate plans. But what happens if you don't have a will? Dying without a will is known as dying intestate or the process is intestacy. Those three functions of a will are essential. These are matters that have to be addressed one way or the other. And if you don't have a will, it doesn't mean that these are not addressed. It simply means that you haven't made the decision for yourself. Instead, state law will fill in the gaps and essentially make these decisions for you. This is one of the most common misunderstandings. Many people assume that these default state laws will provide a result that is comparable to or similar to or even desirable. But in many cases, it's just not true. Those default state laws may not provide a result that is the same as intended. And just as a quick example, if you are married and have two children, you may want that your assets pass to benefit your spouse and your children. And that's fairly common. And state law does say that your assets will pass to benefit your spouse and your children. But what state law actually said is that one third of your assets will go to your spouse and the other two thirds will be divided between your two children. That may not be what you want. You may not want your young children to each receive a third of your estate when you die. And you may be surprised to learn that not having a will leaves your spouse not with the entire house, but only a one third interest. And your spouse may not be able to maintain that house or may not be able to maintain that standard of living because they only received a one third interest instead of an entire interest in the house. A simple will can help prevent that. And a will does not have to be complex, but it is fundamental needs that have to be addressed in a will. And everyone should have a will. After a death, the process of a will it goes through probate. Um, most people have heard of probate, and most people, rightly so, have a negative association with probate. But the purpose of probate is to essentially determine that the will is valid and appoint an executor. This is a judicial process. In California, it goes through the probate court, and the will is presented to the court. The court will essentially look and say, this will meets all of the legal requirements. It is therefore a valid will. Now let's carry out the instructions contained in that will. The first thing that the court does is then appoints the executor who is named in the will in most cases. And the executor is essentially resp responsible for managing the administration of the will. Once the executor is appointed, the executor is in charge of that probate process. And really the executor has a few primary responsibilities. The first is to collect all assets. Everything that is owned and governed by the will, the executor will collect or take ownership of. 
The second is the executor will pay off any debts, expenses, and taxes. So all outstanding obligations will be satisfied. And lastly, the executor will take all remaining assets and distribute those to the beneficiaries as specified in the will. Collect assets, pay debts, distribute assets. It sounds simple. Unfortunately, it's not always that simple. The probate can be an incredibly slow process. Before COVID, a year and a half ago, it was 12 to 18 months from start to finish for a typical probate in California. Uh, now that we've had about nine to 12 months of courts being shut down and limited capacity, that is, that is skyrocketed and you're reasonable to expect 24 to 30, even 36 months to have a full probate process completed. So from the moment of death, it may be three years until that probate process is finally completed. And that three year process is difficult and stressful. It begins immediately after death during a period of grieving a loss. And that, that is tough to add on on top of that, while you're dealing with the loss of a loved one, you need to be now go to court and start handling these legal and administrative tasks. It's, it is a lot emotionally and mentally for someone to take on. And unfortunately, this often brings out resentment and can lead to disputes. There's just a lot going on and it's hard to manage the emotions of probate. And probate is not cheap. It's very, very expensive. Um, a $1 million estate in California can have fees of over $50,000 for probate. And these are, these are fixed fees. These are set by statute. So it's not that you can bypass them in some way, but those, those fees have to be paid out of probate. Uh, and it's important to note that that $1 million estate in that example, that includes the value of your house. And that is the gross value of your house, not just the equity. So if you know, we, we know how real estate prices are these days. If you own a house these days, odds are good that you're at or near that $1 million range. And even if you're at, you know, five, $600,000, you're still looking at $30,000 of fees. And those are fees that have to be paid out of probate. And sometimes there's not that much cash available at death to pay these fees. And so you, you wind up forcing beneficiaries either to sell assets or take out an additional mortgage to, to obtain the cash to pay these fees. It can be incredibly disruptive. I, I cannot stress enough how bad probate can be. And the fact that probate is so bad is a huge motivator for some people to find a way to avoid probate. How do I not have to deal with probate after death? Fortunately, the most common way to avoid probate after death is by using a trust. Uh, most people in California are very familiar with the trust, again, because California probate is so bad. A trust ultimately is a legal agreement between three parties. There's the settlor who creates the trust and puts their property into it. That settlor may also be known as a trustor or a grantor, but that's the person who creates the trust. The second party is the trustee. The trustee is the person who holds and manages the assets in the trust. And the third party is the beneficiary. And that's the person who the trust is in favor of. Basically, the settlor creates a trust, gives assets to the trustee to hold for the beneficiary. It's a three-party relationship, and it seems a little complex, but that's, that's how it typically works. Settlor creates a trust, trustee holds the assets, the beneficiary is who the trust is in favor of. In most cases, the settlor, trustee, and the beneficiary are all the same person initially. Those roles can split. Different people can fill those roles, and who fills those roles can change over time, particularly after death. But it is common that initially when you create a trust, you create it, you are also the trustee to hold the assets, and it's also your trust and you are the beneficiary. The primary purposes of a trust, as we mentioned, are to avoid probate. That's, that's the, the number one motivating factor for people to use a trust these days. But there are additional benefits of a trust. A trust gives you more control over assets and how they are managed and distributed. You have more control with the trust than you do with the will. And this can apply during lifetime and after death. Um, a great example is providing for your family for younger children and, and blended families. If I, I have as a not example, but a true, you may actually hear them at some point, a, a three month old. Um, I may not want my three month old to inherit my estate if I were to pass away today. I may instead wanna say, I'd like this estate to be held in trust for my three month old until she turns 18 or 25 or 30 so that I can be a little more confident that the, the, the funds will be used for good and not blown. I'm, I'm thinking back to the decisions I would have made at age 18 versus the decisions I would have made today. 
And had I been in that situation, I probably would have been better off to have a trust say that I don't suddenly receive all of these assets at age 18. So that's something you can do with the trust. And with blended families, you can also ensure that assets would pass to your spouse and benefit your spouse for the remainder of your spouse's lifetime, and then ultimately benefit your children. You don't have to be worried that you're going to leave everything to your spouse who then gets remarried or passes it on to your spouse's children and, and leaves your children out in the cold. So again, trust gives you more control over when and how assets are distributed. And lastly, trusts do provide a greater degree of tax minimization, and that's important for some people. Right now, the federal estate tax threshold is very high. It's over $11.5 million per person, over $23 million per couple. Most people are not affected by the federal estate tax, but that could change. We have a new administration. There's been talk about lowering that. It's something to bear in mind, even if it's not important today. In the future, a trust could be a useful tool to minimize death taxes. Um, and we. The, I said lastly, but there's one other key feature of a trust is incapacity planning. A trust does exist during your lifetime and a trust can provide protection so that if you are incapacitated during your lifetime, the trust can provide for a seamless transition to allow someone else to step in, manage your affairs and continue to ensure that all of your needs are met from your assets with no interruption at all. So a trust is increasingly important as we have people more focused on planning for incapacity. The trustee is a key role in the trust. All of the things, all of these purposes, all of these responsibilities, these are all carried out by the trustee. So it's important to think of who should fill that role. And in many ways, the trustee is like the CEO of a trust. The trustee is bound by law and they are obligated to follow the instructions left in your trust. But it's still a critical role. And there are some cases where the trustee will have to make choices between one or two or three various options and choose which path to pursue. So it's important to have someone that you trust and someone that you believe can make decisions that you would agree with. The trustee may also be called to work with other advisors, either financial advisors or legal advisors. And so it's important to have someone that is capable of doing that. There's a lot of record keeping. It's a very administrative task. The trustee may be paying bills and keeping, keeping invoices. So it should think through who might be equipped to handle those duties. Ultimately, it should be someone that you trust. It should be someone who is able to carry out the duties of the trust. And it should be someone that knows you and knows what you would want. Typical choices are a spouse, a child, or children, or other relatives or even close friends. You do sometimes see business partners, things like that, but ultimately it needs to be someone that you trust and someone that knows you well enough that they can make decisions that you would agree with. Um, it's also important to note that there's not just one type of trusts. Um, the revocable living trust is what we've been discussing, and that is the most commonly used type of trust. When most people think of a trust, they think of a revocable living trust. A revocable living trust, revocable just means it can be revoked. Living just means it's created while you're alive. So it's a trust that you create during your lifetime that you can revoke or amend or change throughout your lifetime. I Probably 90, 95% of the trusts that are created today are revocable living trusts. There are other types of trusts though. There are a few on this screen. One is a testamentary trust. This is less commonly used. Um, it's created by a will instead of by a separate standalone trust document. Um, and it's only effective at death. The benefit of a testamentary trust is it provides you some of the key benefits of a trust, but it's a little bit easier to create because it's not created via a separate trust document. But there's a major downside because it's created under a will that will typically will have to go through probate. So you may not have the benefit of avoiding probate. So a testamentary trust can be an option for some people, but the fact that it has to go through probate isn't a great choice for everyone. Um, there are some other options here, and these are broad categories, tax planning trusts. There are various types of trusts that can be used to minimize taxes. Um, some examples might be, you may have heard these terms, a credit shelter trust or a Q-tip, a marital trust, or even an irrevocable life insurance trust. These can be useful, but these are typically very, very specific tools meant to address very specific problems. Um, this would not be the type of trust that you would use as part of a general estate plan. And then lastly, other trusts. Um, 
trust that may not be used for taxes, but for other, again, specific purposes. Um, a special needs trust, asset protection trust, Medicaid planning, trust like this, these all help solve very specific needs. Um, I note on here a special needs trust because it's one that may be overlooked, um, but it's important to at least recognize that it exists. Um, a special needs trust is a type of trust that is designed to protect beneficiaries who have additional needs. If you have a beneficiary who is receiving governmental assistance or supplemental care assistance, leaving them an inheritance may disqualify them from being eligible to receive those governmental benefits. Instead, you can use a special needs trust to ensure that the beneficiary is still able to receive the benefit of those assets without losing eligibility for the governmental assistance. So a special needs trust, while it is a special purpose trust, it is important to call attention to that because it may be important to have a special needs trust either as a piece of your plan or as a separate addition to your plan. But that is that is one to note that can work with a revocable living trust. Um, another common question we get is the difference between a will and a trust. Um, this is probably the most frequently asked question we have, and it's a great question. Um, trusts and wills have a lot in common and they have some key differences. They are not true alternatives. Each can do some things that the other cannot do. So we frequently have the question asked of, do I need a will or do I need a trust? And really we think it's better to think of it as everyone needs a will, but some people also need a trust. You, you never have a situation where you have a trust without a will, but you may have a situation that you have a will that does not also have a trust paired with it. But a few of the key differences, um, both of them can handle the disposition of assets after death. They definitely have that in common. Um, trusts avoid probate, but wills do go through probate. Trusts give you more control over when and how assets are distributed. Wills are a little, little less control. Um, wills can be easier to set up, Trust can be a little more work to set up. Um, trusts do apply during lifetime. Again, that's important if you're planning for incapacity during lifetime. Wills only apply after death, so wills have no impact on incapacity planning. Um, wills also will allow you to nominate guardians for your children and pets and specify your final arrangements. This doesn't happen with a trust. Um, so again, trusts are usually paired with a will as a set. Everyone needs a will. Some people should also have a trust. Uh, when might you want to consider having a trust is another great question. Um, it's, it's very specific to your situation of whether or not you need a trust. But a few things that you might think about, um, if you have younger children, rather than having all of your assets go to your kids immediately at death or when they turn 18, a trust can let you set triggers for asset distributions. And these triggers could be you know, reaching certain ages. Maybe, maybe distribution is made at age 30 or life events. Uh, maybe the distribution is made partially when your child graduates from college or gets married or has their own child, things like that. That can help you stretch out distributions. It can help you kind of encourage a lifestyle that you would want to promote for your child. And it can help you avoid the likelihood that a young child will blow an inheritance at age 18 and then be left with nothing to protect them for the rest of their life. Um, trust also can handle more complex family dynamics. Again, blended families and second marriages. The trust can let you benefit your spouse for their lifetime, but then still ensure that your assets ultimately pass to your kids. Um, blended families, second marriages, that's a, a huge, a huge issue for people to start looking at a trust as opposed to relying on a will. Um, trusts do provide a little more privacy than a will. Um, wills become public after death. The probate process is a judicial process. The will is presented to the court. Those become court records, which can be searched and located through court records. Is it likely that someone's going to go down the courthouse and search for your will after death? No. But can it be done? Absolutely. So if you're looking to add a little more privacy, a layer of privacy protection in there, a trust is a great option. And again, a trust can provide a little more benefit for those at higher asset levels. Again, probate avoidance, uh, trusts do avoid probate. At 160000 or so in California, that's really where that starts to become important. If you're over 160000 of assets, a trust and the probate avoidance really start to be something you should maybe look at considering. And if you're much higher, as I mentioned, you can start looking at a state tax minimization, and even income tax minimization. This is typically measured more on the, the millions or tens of millions of level, but it could be lower in the future. So higher asset levels do give you an opportunity for more advanced planning. And that's something you can do with a trust that you cannot do with a will. Um, the other 
important documents, the last set are known as healthcare documents. We have wills, we have trusts, and we have healthcare documents. And the healthcare documents, it's not a single document, it's a set of documents that are just grouped together and referred to as healthcare documents. Um, you may sometimes see these referred to as disability documents or, or lifetime care documents. There, there are various names for these documents, but there are three that are most commonly used. The first is a power of attorney. Um, this sometimes is known as a durable power of attorney or a financial power of attorney, but a power of attorney is a document that allows you to designate someone else to make financial decisions and non-medical decisions for you. This is typically used in the event of incapacity, but it can be set up in various ways. You can have a power of attorney that only comes into effect if you lose capacity, or you can have it set up so it's in effect immediately. Um, it's most common to have it in effect immediately so that there's no question of whether or not that trigger of incapacity has been pulled. You don't have to worry about getting a, a medical order or a court order if you were to go to a bank and you need to prove that this power of attorney is in effect. But a power of attorney would allow someone to take all financial and non-medical decisions for you. Um, things like paying your taxes, paying um, property taxes, you know, handling anything to do with the bank, you know, recording deeds, anything that is not medical, any, any sort of paperwork that you would do, a power of attorney would typically be in a document that allows someone else to handle that on your behalf. The second document is a, an advanced healthcare directive, sometimes known as a living will. Um, the, the term living will is a bit confusing because it has absolutely nothing to do with a last will, but it's frequently confused. So an advanced healthcare directive or a living will. This is what allows you to specify your own medical preferences in advance, and it lets you designate someone else to make medical decisions for you. A power of attorney deals with everything except medical decisions, and a healthcare directive deals with only medical decisions. So the two of those work together and have an entire set of coverage, but one of them is medical and one of them is not medical. The healthcare directive is increasingly important. Again, as we've covered a few times, the likelihood of incapacity has increased. And the healthcare directive is what lets you say what should happen for your medical care if you're unable to make decisions in the future. It's a set of instructions for what you would like to happen. Typically, this includes instructions for things like life support. Would you like to be left on a ventilator? Would you like to be fed through artificial hydration and nutrition? Those are very, very personal decisions, and it's important for you to specify those in your own healthcare directive. But importantly, a healthcare directive also designates that agent to make those decisions for you. That agent essentially stands in your shoes and is able to convey your consent or withdraw your consent to your physicians and your medical providers. So if there's some other situation that comes up and perhaps there's a choice of should we pursue this aggressive treatment that, that may save you or may have these catastrophic side effects, your agent can make that decision on your behalf. These always apply even in the event of incapacity. The primary purpose of these documents is to have someone represent you when you are incapacitated. So these documents are always going to set up to apply during incapacity. The third of the healthcare documents is known as a HIPAA authorization. HIPAA is a federal law. You've probably heard of it. It essentially says that your medical providers cannot share your private and confidential medical information with others. It's a privacy-based law. HIPAA authorization essentially allows your medical providers to discuss with your designated agents and representatives concerns about your medical decisions, uh, types of treatments, your care, all of those things. So while your estate plan appoints others to make decisions about your medical care, the HIPAA authorization is essentially their permission slip to speak with your physician about your medical care. This is frequently overlooked. Um, and it's really, really important. Um, medical providers are increasingly hesitant to speak with anyone who does not have an express authorization, a HIPAA authorization. So it's important to make sure that your estate plan has that HIPAA authorization paired with your healthcare directive. That set of healthcare documents, um, those are included in your estate plan, but it's important to note that those apply during your lifetime. Your power of attorney, your healthcare directive, and your HIPAA authorization, those only exist and only have any legal effect while you are still alive. But it's often, those are often overlooked. And many people think of an estate plan, it happens, what happens when I die and what happens to my assets? But 
almost almost every time if you start talking to people as they're going through the process and creating their own estate plan and say what was important to you what motivated you to do this what are the decisions that mattered the most these are where those decisions are typically made it's in the healthcare documents these are the ones that what happens to your stuff after you die it's important but it may be less important than what happens to you so I, I really want to emphasize the importance of these healthcare documents and not to overlook them and not to look and say i just want a will or i just want to trust Regardless of a will or a will and a trust, be sure that you have it paired with healthcare documents. These can be incredibly important to you, but also important to your loved ones to know that whatever decisions are made, they can rest comfortably knowing that they made the decision you wanted made. So who needs an estate plan? Um, ultimately, all adults need an estate plan. If you're over the age of 18, you should have some estate plan. Um, at the very least, you should have a will in place and you should have those healthcare documents in place. The most common reasons for someone to think about creating an estate plan, honestly, when you turn 18, it's not the top of mind for most people. Most people wait a little bit, but then the, later on, they have something that says, maybe it's time for me to start thinking about this. And the most common reasons are marriage, um, having children. Typically, your first child, you're so tired that you don't think about it, but your second child, you might start to think about it um accumulating assets so as you as you progress through life and you start to look and you're like hey i have i have a little bit more now than i did when i was 18 it's maybe it's important for me to think about what happens to this after i die so accumulating assets is a primary motivating factor uh, medical concerns can be a motivating factor if people think hey i've been diagnosed with something i either have an acute illness or i am at risk for a progressive degenerative disease i need to have a plan in place now I need to make these decisions now because I won't be able to make these decisions in the future. Um, and unfortunately, dealing with someone else's death, it's increasingly likely that the reason you go about creating your own estate plan is that you've had to deal with a family member or a loved one not having a plan in place, or you've dealt with their death and you've said, I've been so grateful that they had a plan in place. I wanna get my own plan in place that my family feels just as grateful as I felt. So those are the most common reasons to create an estate plan. Um, but your plan is not a one and done event. Your plan should evolve as your life does. Um, the, the situation you were in when you were 18 or 22 or 25 is likely not the same situation you are in today. Um, and your plan, as your life evolves, your plan should evolve as well. And the most common reasons to update a plan are births, deaths, changes in marital status, and the passage of time. So even if you haven't had any births or deaths or changes in marital status, you should really consider updating your plan every three to five years. And that's simply because laws can change. Um, if three years ago, we had a major change in, in trusts that were perfect four years ago, now are no longer as perfect under the new law changes. And so you may not know that, but it's important to go through the process of saying, at least look at it and think, do I need to make an update? At least revisit the idea of updating your state plan every three to five years. Um, another thing to think about in that passage of time is you've designated guardians for your children. Are those guardians still the same people you want? It's very common for someone to designate their parents as the guardian for their children. As they get older, your parents also get older and your kids get older. Maybe you, your parents, as they get in their 70s and 80s, are no longer the best guardians. Maybe you want to start looking to your, your siblings, something like that. So as time passes, just keep in the back of my mind, should I update my estate plan? Just revisit it every three to five years. Also, to, in order to note, as children become adults, they need their own estate plan. While your child is under age 18, you have parental rights. If something happens to your child, you have a say. You can make medical decisions. You can go to the bank and represent them. You can act as their parent. But the moment your child turns 18, they need to have legal documents to let you act on their behalf. And that is frequently overlooked. But it's as simple as having a will and a set of healthcare documents that names you as their representative to ensure that if something happens to your child, you can continue to act in their best interests. So as children become adults, be sure that they have their own plans in place as well. Fortunately, as children become adults, you should also be updating your plan because you may no longer need to appoint guardians for your children as well. But just that, that threshold of as your children get older, it's important not only for you to update your plan, but it's important to have them put their plan in place as well. So how do you go about creating an estate plan? 
Um, there's a couple of different ways. There's always the old fashioned route of finding a local estate planning attorney. That's what I did. As Josh mentioned, I have about 10 years of practicing that in a law firm. It's an option. It works. Um, it doesn't work for everyone, unfortunately. It, the process can be difficult to find an estate planning attorney. They typically work nine to five ish, and then you have to go into their office. You have to take time out of your work, and it's 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 just not effective for everyone. Um, there are some other options like trust and will that can provide you with tools to create your own estate plan, and that's really how trust and will was born born from the recognition that the traditional way of creating an estate plan was not working for everyone. The process can be expensive, confusing, and intimidating. And I've, I've been on the other side of that table and I have seen people come in and they're just uncomfortable with the process. Many people had no plans in place or had plans that were very outdated because they did not want to go through that process again. So Trust and Will chose to embrace technology. We've developed an easy and affordable way to create a high quality, fully customized documents that are on par with those traditionally crafted by attorneys. As Josh mentioned, in many ways, we're the TurboTax of estate planning. Um, essentially, you go through, you answer questions, and you generate documents at the end that are tailored to your particular needs. Um, we offer three tiers of products. I've mentioned that your, your plan should evolve as your life evolves, and we've tried to build that into our system as well. Um, our basic product is Guardian. And this is really focused on new parents who are just looking to name a guardian for their child. It's typically the, the first step into preparing an estate plan. If something happens to me, who will take care of my children? Um, that's typically aimed at a younger demographic, but it's a great entryway to get people thinking about estate planning. But we do offer both a will-based plan and a trust-based plan. The will plan is a standard plan. It covers a wide range of needs, most needs for most people. It does include both the will and that full set of healthcare documents. We also have our trust plan. It's more comprehensive. Again, it provides all the benefits of a trust. It includes the will, the trust, and the full set of healthcare documents. Lastly, we do offer the ability to receive individualized review, guidance, and advice from a licensed estate planning attorney. Um, we have an attorney review and consultation option. You can get attorney support. It ensures that you understand how your plan works and ensure that you believe and have confidence that this plan is the right plan for your needs. Currently, we're available in California. We cover about a third of the population across the country. and We're expanding that throughout 2021, but that gives you the option to actually connect with an estate planning attorney, answer all the questions that you have, make sure that the documents fit your particular needs, but then continue to go through at the end, you have your documents that you've created easily through trustandwill.com, but then you've also paired that with individualized attorney guidance and support. So we, I, I'm a bit biased, but I think trust and will is a great option, but really, even if you just wanna learn more about estate planning to figure out what's best for you, you can always head to trustandwill.com and look for the learn link at the top of the page. We, we try to be a resource, even if we're not the solution for everyone, we wanna be a resource for everyone. We have a wealth of information about estate planning, about what you need to know, how to decide what's best for you and how to get started with your plan. We have representatives so you can chat with on our site, you can schedule a call, we can learn more. We, we, we aim to help, ultimately that's what we want to do. We want to make this process better for everyone. Um, we've had some of those representatives standing by and helping throughout this fielding questions as we go. Um, I think we probably have you know, a good bit of time left to answer a few other questions. So let's, um, kick that off now. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can all see my face. Um, happy joy for everyone. And we can take a look at some of the questions that we have. Um, and again, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them either into the chat or into the, the Q&A as well. Um, we can answer some of these now. Um, but if you have questions that come up after this, don't feel that you've missed your chance. You can always head to trustandwill.com or visit through CalCoast and uh, get, a, get a link there as well to learn more about it. Let's see, a couple of these common questions. Um, first, we had a question about starting with the will and adding a trust later. Yeah, that's absolutely something you can do. And that is, that is a very common process for many people. You start with the will that meets your needs today. And as your life changes, you look back and you think, man, maybe I need to add a trust to this. I have more complex needs now, or I'm more concerned about probate. Yes, it is very common to start with the will and then later add on a trust. Um, you can do that with an attorney. You can do it easily with trustandwill.com. Um, it's, it's as simple as <laughs> filling out two or three extra questions and then suddenly you've had a trust added to your plan and you print it and sign it. Um, very, very common uh, approach. Uh, another question about leaving specific assets to people, like how do you leave your spouse, your home, but everything else to children? Oh, that's a great question too. 
So with an estate plan, there are a couple of different ways that you can leave assets to beneficiaries. You can either leave all of your assets to beneficiary. You could say 100% of everything I own goes to my spouse, for example, or you can be specific and you can designate a particular asset to go to a particular individual. So you could say, I want my house to go to my spouse, or I want my car to go to my nephew, you, any, anything. I've, <laughs> I've seen a collection of antique diving helmets. I've seen um, an individual who owned, I think it was around four, 40 surfboards that designated one each to 40 different beneficiaries. Uh, you can get item by item specific, as, as specific as you would like to be. Um, and you can also do a hybrid of those two approaches so that you could say, I'd like my house and my surfboards to go to my spouse, and then everything else, I would like it to go 50% to each of my two children. So definitely a great option to leave specific gifts to specific beneficiaries. Um, who can I appoint as an executor? Oh, that's a great question. We covered some of the roles of an executor. Again, the executor is responsible for managing the administration of a will after death. You can appoint any individual who is over the age of 18. It's most common to appoint um, a spouse or a family member. It's not always the case, but it is common to appoint a spouse or a family member. Again, bear in mind that the role of an executor may require some administrative financial task. They may have to work with an attorney. They may have to work with a financial advisor. Um, it's not uncommon to find yourself in a situation where your spouse just may not want to take that on. And you may instead choose to appoint a, a child or your brother or even just a close friend who may feel more comfortable handling those tasks. But you can appoint anyone over the age of 18. If you appoint someone outside of the U.S., the court may require them to essentially partner with someone in the U.S. just to make it easier to, to deal with. Um, but anyone over the age of 18, you, you typically can appoint um, as an executor. And then another question about what assets to include in an estate plan. That's a great question. Um, there are, the will will cover essentially anything you own in your individual name at death. Um, a trust only covers assets that have been placed into the trust. So when you create a trust, you can then transfer assets into the trust. A lot of people think of a trust like a box and then you put assets into the box. Um, if you're a visual person, that, that may help. Um, but the trust will apply to anything that's held in the name of the trust, and the will applies to everything that's held in your name at death. There are some other assets. Um, a great example might be life insurance. Life insurance has a beneficiary, and if you have a beneficiary designation in place, your life insurance will not be covered by your will or be covered by your trust. That beneficiary designation essentially says these proceeds just automatically pay to the beneficiary. No probate, no trust directly there. Same thing with most retirement plans, some pensions, things like that. You can actually, in California now, you can even set up your home to have a designated beneficiary. It's a little less common, but you can use beneficiary designations. It's important to note that those beneficiary designations are best to be paired with an estate plan, not a substitute for an estate plan. And the reason why is simple. Beneficiary designations can fail. The beneficiary can die. They can be filled out incorrectly. There can be any number of things that go wrong. And if something goes wrong, the fallback is that those assets would pass through your estate plan. So even if you wanna use a beneficiary designation, you should always still have at the very least a will, but a full estate plan in place to make sure that you have essentially a backstop so that if something fails on those beneficiary designations, you're still protected. Um, Let's see, can a person designate others to the estate if beneficiaries pass on? I, I believe this question, I, uh, please let me know if I'm misinterpreting this, but you can designate essentially a primary beneficiary and then a secondary or a backup beneficiary. So I could, for example, name my spouse to receive all of my assets and then say, if my spouse has also died, my assets would instead go to my children. So you, you can kind of have multiple layers or, or multiple options so that you can say, it goes to this person if they're available. If this person's not available, it goes to that person over there. Um, does a pension need to be in a trust or is listing beneficiaries on the pension sufficient? That's a great question. Um, the first two words they teach you in law school are it depends. Um, but it does depend in this case because it depends on what your pension says. Some pensions may allow you to transfer the ownership of that pension into a trust, but it's more common that that will not be the case. Rather than transferring the ownership of the pension into the trust, it is more common to look at what happens to that pension 
at death. So if there is a death payout or a death benefit of that pension, can you designate the trust to be the beneficiary of that death benefit? So you can do that, or you could designate your spouse if you want. Those are great options. There are some financial considerations you may want to think through. If you have an attorney or financial advisor, you can run those questions by them. But we also have some guidance available on trustandwill.com that can kind of help you understand should your trust be the primary beneficiary or the backup beneficiary for a thing like a, a pension or, or other types of retirement plans. Um, we have questions come in now. Do we review wills that are already created? We do not review wills that are already created. Um, we we provide you an option to create a new will. Um, and, the, and the reason it's simpler that way is that every three to five years, you should look at updating your will. And if you have a question about whether or not your will should be updated, rather than spending the time to review the will and then say, this should or should not be updated, typically it's faster to just create a new will. Um, it's, most people create their will through trust in the will in 15, 20 minutes. We can't even review a will that fast. So if, if you're thinking about, should I update my will? Before you answer that question, you can actually just go through and update the will, and, and then it's actually, you, you've bypassed the question entirely. So we, we do not review wills. We have a simpler process of even creating a new will. Let's see. Um, we have a question. What's the typical cost for these services? Um, ballpark answers are fine. Yeah, that's great. So it depends on, on the provider. Um, if you go to an attorney, you can get a wide range of services, a uh, wide range of cost. Um, some attorneys will have low prices. They may include some features or omit some features. Some attorneys will be much higher prices. They typically include a wide range of features. Um, for a will, a will instead of healthcare documents, typical cost could be somewhere in the $1,000, $1,500, maybe $2,000 range. There will be some higher prices. There will be some lower. Um, for a trust-based estate plan, again, that comprehensive set of documents, you're typically looking at $3,500, $5,000 or more. Again, there are some attorneys that can do it for less. They typically do it for less by streamlining on those processes. Whether or not that's a, a cost savings you want to embrace is a great option for you to consider. But three, 3,500, 5,000 is, is a rough range for what you might pay if you go to an estate planning attorney in California for a trust. Um, for trust and will, our will-based estate plan for an individual starts at $89. And our trust-based estate plan for an individual starts at $399. Um, our prices are much lower than those of an attorney. And that's simply because we rely on technology and we are able to skip a lot of the high cost issues that are inherent in, in a, a law firm. We don't have rent. We don't have to pay paralegals. We're not having to pay uh, malpractice insurance and all, all of the things that attorneys have to pay. We're not having to pay um, partner salaries and associate salaries and things like that. Instead, we've leveraged technology to essentially take the estate planning form software that attorneys would use and make it available to you directly, cutting out the middleman and, and passing along those savings to you. Um, along those, I should mention that along those um, lines. Those prices I referenced as $89 and the $399. Those are our retail prices. Um, CalCoast members do receive 15% off trust and will services. So if you'd like to learn more, definitely, definitely check out calcocu.org. Um, I think there's a link in the in the chat. Yep, there's a link in the chat right there. So those those prices that I think are already remarkably low or even even lower for CalCoast uh, members as well. Um, and so you can also get additional benefits as a city of San Diego employee for partnering or joining with CalCoast. Um, so there's lots of information available in the chat um, about CalCoast, the benefits of CalCoast and how to actually have a discount on trusted will services. And if you have more questions about estate planning in the process, either head to calcoastcu.org or go directly to trustandwill.com um, and we can get you connected through our Learn Center so you can learn more, but definitely, um, Definitely go to calcocu.org if you're looking to, to drop those prices even a little bit more. Let's see, Ooh, we have one last question. I think we can take this one and then kick it back to you, Josh. Um, so what happens if probate does not start away, right away when someone passes? What happens after X number of years if it does not start? That's a great question. Um, it can be a mess. It, the size of the mess can depend on a lot of factors. Um, for example, if real estate is owned in the name of a decedent and there's no probate, then how do you ultimately transfer the title to that property? Do you, how do you sell it or pass it on to a beneficiary after death? Typically you are required to have some sort of authority, some sort of documentation 
that allows you to transfer that title out. And that's something you would have to get through probate. So if you don't get it immediately after death and you wait three or five years, it's just going to be that much harder to go back and open that probate process and go through it. The records are going to be less accessible. The will may not be available. Um, there is a state law that if there is a will, the will has to be turned over to court within a set period of time. So um, it's typically not um, an unfixable problem, but it is very much an avoidable problem. So I would I would encourage anyone who's who's considering that to to seek further guidance about how to best solve that problem. Um, we have a couple more a couple more questions. A couple minutes. I'll be fast. Um, if you need to modify a trust, can you take it to a financial advisor? Some financial advisors um, can do that. Some financial advisors will will do that. Um, that's a choice you can make. Not all of them will do it for the simple fact that estate planning is something that they may not have expertise in and a financial advisor might not be the person who should be updating your trust so can you take it to your financial advisor perhaps should you it's a slightly different question um and then what's the average estate size or size range that trust will works with oh that's a great question we can handle um, a wide range of estates we have everything from you know very very low nominal values for people who are primarily looking at appointing guardians for the children all the way up to you know, tens of millions of dollars. So we, we've designed our, our documents, our forms, and our software to provide solutions that are not set for one particular value range, but are instead flexible enough to cover a wide range. And that's not just by stretching these provisions. We actually, as we go through and you enter your choices, our software will then go through and say, based off the selections you've entered, we're changing the provisions of our documents so that if you have a higher asset level and you've opted for more tax-based provisions, the documents you generate will include provisions that may not be included in a more simple, streamlined, lower value um, estate. So we can handle all the way from low value up to incredibly high value, everything in between. And, and I think we do it fairly well with our documents, but we, we, we have no upper bound or lower bound on that. All right, I think... Um, I think we've got all the questions. Again, if you do have any other questions, this isn't the end of the time. You can always go to trustthewill.com, um, chat with one of our representatives there, learn more there. You can always go to calcocu.org and get more information about how to get to trust the will, how to get those benefits, the benefits of joining. I think Josh can give you a little more information about that as well. Yes, thank you so much, Patrick. Wow, a ton of information and a lot, a lot of questions. I think there was like 15 questions just in the Q&A box. This is awesome. Uh, those of you that still have questions that maybe did not get a full answer, the answer that you're looking for, yes, uh, contact us. I think uh, maybe the easiest way to streamline it would be to contact myself or Tim Feria, uh, and um, we can answer your questions for you. So I will put um, our emails in the chat box before we conclude. Uh, but just want to thank you, Patrick. This has been a really, really great session. Uh, a lot of interaction. Oh my gosh, actually, Patrick and the whole team, Katie, Allison, uh, Fabio, uh, thank you so much for all the great information you've provided. And uh, please, uh, for those of you in attendance, please check out uh, in the chat. I put uh, the link to the, the website that is specific for Calc or for um, City of San Diego employees. Uh, so you can go and check that out. It's got all the benefits that we offer uh, as a credit union to you guys that are at no charge. And um, you can check it out. There's everything from our um, enriched financial wellness portal to our virtual um, financial wellness center where we have live representatives. Um, you can also go to our website, like Patrick mentioned, and check out the estate planning info there with the discount that we offer. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a member, we have a special for you on that. So all kinds of stuff, it's all free. Uh, we actually pay you to become a member. So if you're interested, let us know. Um, like I said, I'll put in the emails um, for Tim and myself, and um, you can contact us if you have more questions. Also on the survey that pops up at the end, there's a follow-up piece at the bottom. So if you do want to be contacted, you can just notate that there. You can just answer yes, that you want to learn more and we will follow up with you. Uh, so with that, I just want to thank everyone from the Trust and Will team for uh, joining us and all the great information once again, and uh, Tim as well for, for being there to answer any questions that we might've had, but um, keep uh, an eye out for the next session coming up in May. Uh, you should be seeing an email coming to you in, in the coming weeks. Um, I believe the topic is auto buying. Don't, don't quote me on that. There's a lot of different webinars we do. So <laughs> I can't recall exactly right now, but uh, anyway, uh, we'll see you for our next session and thank you for joining us, everyone. Take care.